So I want to share with you what I did last week. Last week, I visited a school in Cambridge, Massachusetts, MA, and it's probably not the school you imagine when I say school. Uh, in this school, there are no subjects, no grade level classes, no tests, and no homework. So what there is, uh, it's a studio model that encourages students to work on real life problems in project-based learning way. So basically, they use a makerspace. It's a group of students who work with 3D printers and laser cutter, and they are working on real life problems. So how many of us had this kind of innovative experience? You can raise your hand. None. How many of your kids have this kind of? Probably not enough. This is very sad. None? No one? A little bit. A little bit. Um, yeah, non-formal education. Uh, so I want to share with you a little bit of my experiences that in the past year while conducting my research. I explore the work of innovative teachers, teachers who work in regular, traditional public schools, and they're doing something different. They, they try new, new things. And I want to share in two minutes the highlights of my findings. So what I found is that those educations are the ones that ask questions. They reflect upon their work and they challenge the traditional ways. They, they're not happy with the answer, this is how it's always been done, but they keep ask questions and try new things. They take risks. They try new things not knowing if it will succeed or not, but they try it anyway because they think it might be a better way to do things. They are very creative, they think outside the box, and they use many existing resources in their environment to do it. Um, those who create new practices in edu education usually work in teams, collaborate, and admire or think that collaboration is the way to go. Innovative teachers, this is what I found, see the promise in technology. Not just the technology uh, itself and the endless way it can uh, promote learning and development. They perceive technology as a disruptive force, and this is a term I think you'll hear more, that can help us change the way or the traditional pedagogy that we use in our education systems. Um, and based on those findings and more, uh, I find that educators actually should act as hackers. Now, hackers is a term from computer world. It used to be a very, very negative, criminal even term. And I think educators should be hackers, and that's why. Uh, hackers are expected to find weaknesses in system, to develop creative solutions, and to collaborate with others to promote shared goals. Hackers are described as professionals who are passionate and enjoy what they do in a culture which combines excellence, playfulness, cleverness, and exploration. And I think that's how educators should act. They should hack learning, classrooms, schools, and higher education institutions. When I found out about, about the participants in this panel, I was very excited because I realized I have a group of hackers here, and they'll share if they agree to the term. Um, and we have an exciting opportunity to peek into what they're hacking, what they're doing, um, uh, and the opportunity to learn from leaders of higher education in Israel and from leading uh, ed tech, which stands for educational technology company. Um, so let me begin by introducing the panel. Um, I'll do it shortly, as they asked, but, but still. So Professor Yuli Tamir, former Israeli education minister and the head of Association for Civil Rights, was appointed for president of Shankar in 2010. I don't think we need to present Shankar, but it's a higher institution in Israel for art and design, design and engineering. Yeah. Um, Tamir was appointed Minister of Immigrant Absorption and a few years later was appointed member of the Knesset by the Avodah Party, was an active member in many committees. Following the 2007 elections, Tamir was appointed Minister of Education and led the Ofek Hadash New Horizon Reform, one of the broadest reforms that were implemented in the Israeli education system and still being relevant. In the 18th Knesset, Tamir served as Vice Chairman of the Israeli Parliament, Knesset Speaker, and as an active member in several committees. 
Thank you for joining. <laughs> Professor Adi Stern, I will not go by. We're trying to be creative here. He's the president of the Bezalel Acad Academy of Arts and Design in Jerusalem. He's a graphic designer, top designer, and design educator. At this field of expertise is typographic and typeface design. He writes, consults, and lectures on the design and history of the Hebrew letter. Adi was a selected artist of the Israel Culture Ex Excellent Foundation and the recipient of the Israeli Minister of Education and Culture Design Prize. In your time? <laughs> he has worked with many clients, such as the Design Museum Cholon, Tel Aviv Museum, the Bacheva Dance Company, Yad Vashem, and many others. Many of his works have been exhibited internationally and have won awards worldwide. Thank you for coming all the way from Jerusalem. <laughs> to my right, Dr. Edith Arel, award-winning pioneer in inventing new technology for cultivating creative learning, innovation, and globalization through constructionist learning. That was a long sentence. She's an Israeli-American entrepreneur who founded Globaloria, Google it later, to provide STEM uh, and computing courses to schools worldwide to prepare youth for the global no knowledge economy. Edith is a published author and speaker worldwide and has been serving in many advisory boards and committees. She's known to say that STEM and computer science is the new literacy and coding is the new writing. Thanks, Edith. <laughs> and Jonathan, Jonathan Shore, the co-founder and CEO of CodeMonkey Studios. CodeMonkey is an award-winning platform for teaching children to code through an engaging online game. I actually did it. It is engaging. Started in Israel only three years ago and successfully rolled out to 75% of Israeli schools. Jonathan relocated to New York a year ago to accelerate CodeMonkey's expansion in the U.S. The company's ready-to-use curriculum was chosen by government, districts, and thousands of schools and is being used by over 3.3 million users worldwide. Thank you. So, that's exciting. I want you to start by telling us, sharing a little bit of what you're doing this year. What's the most cutting edge things you're doing? How you're being hacking of education? What you're doing now or your plans for the next year? Share us your dream, passion, inspire us. Um, good afternoon. Maybe I'll start with saying, uh, well, you were saying, Maya, that uh, we are uh, we talk about hacking education, and uh, and educators should be hackers. And I think that not only educators should be hackers; everyone should be hackers. So we have to educate people to be or yeah, everyone, pupils and students, not only design students, but every student to be a hacker. And um, it's mostly, well, it's, I'm not really answering your question, but uh, That's okay. uh, <laughs> I want to react to this. Um, yes, it's, I think it's uh, as a design educator and uh, coming from this field of design, I want to share with you this idea of uh, what is called now or described here as hacking. It's really about how you see the world and how you treat problems, how do you approach issues, and mostly and above all, in my view, it's about not taking anything for granted and uh, accepting nothing as uh, um, the only answer. There's no one answer, never, ever. Uh, the first thing I say to students on their first year at Betzalel, I tell them, uh, that nothing is objective, everything is subjective, and two and two is sometimes four, sometimes it's seven, sometimes it's 11, and everything is fine. Um, this is a sort of a hacking or a hacker thinking, way of thinking. And uh, uh, for me, this kind of critical thinking and the way you approach issues uh, is, is very crucial in, in the way we educate designers, but in that sense, I think we, that's the way we have to educate any, anyone and everyone. Um, coming back to the, your question of what we are doing now, and perhaps just to 
uh, mention one thing. Uh, Bezalel is now uh, moving, or not now, but we intend to move back to the city center of Jerusalem, and we're building a new campus, a magnificent building uh, planned by Japanese architect Sana, uh, and we are now in the process of rethinking our spaces and how do we want this building to be in order to enable us uh, new ways of education. How do we want to educate designers, architects, and artists at Bezalel, and just to give you one idea that we're dealing with, it's, uh, and actually it's th this is the main idea of this building, it is transparency. It's, it's about creating a transparent um, space, both in terms of people from the outside, the, 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 the public that can uh, see what's happening in the school, as well as our students to, to, to that will be, will be able to see out, uh, outwards, but also, and perhaps even more importantly, it's the fact that students in one department will imagine student architects s uh, st sitting in a studio and being able, while studying, while working on, them pro on their projects, uh, they are able to see what's going on at the very same moment in the fine arts department or at the industrial design department. So this idea of transparency as a tool, as a vehicle that will enable and encourage uh, a collaboration is very important to us, and this is just one thing to begin with, perhaps, to fuel this uh, discussion. Thank you. Whoever. Do it in order. Uh, so you were asking about our challenges this year, right? Uh, challenges? Yeah. Um, okay, so I'll start describing the background. So uh, for anyone not familiar, so CodeMonkey is actually a very simple, uh, like you said, online game that uh, users, mostly children, but not only go through by themselves, they solve uh, p small programming riddles, and that, wa and that way, step by step, uh, they're being introduced to computer programming, to coding concepts. Uh, it was implemented very successfully in Israel the last two school years uh, through a competition model, not a course, where teachers actually use the game to teach computer science, but actually as a sort of a self-paced uh, activity where kids just go through the game themselves, and they compete between schools, uh, which school will achieve best on average uh, inside the game. Uh, it was very successful in scaling um, the curriculum quickly, like you said, in 75% of schools. Uh, but it presents three challenges, I think, for us to focus on uh, now. Um, the first one um, is to try and move in our product and activities that the product that the platform offers, moving from learning and problem solving, which is what they do when they go through the CodeMonkey game today, into creativity. Uh, because a lot of the motivation behind teaching computer science and learning computing science, computer science is that it provi provides an excellent uh, sort of platform to be creative on. Uh, so this is one challenge, moving from just problem solving to creativity. Uh, second thing is, of course, this is sort of a business mission for me, but uh, we, uh, we launched the U.S. office a year ago, uh, and my mission is to try and replicate this amazing success that we had with the Israeli school system into the American school system, which you all probably know better than me. It has its uh, own unique challenges, high fragmentation, and all kind of, uh, well, uh, structure uh, challenges. So that's the second challenge. Um, and the third challenge is very interesting, and it's relevant in every school system all over the world. Uh, the movement of teaching kids to code uh, all over the world in K-12 has been always very successful in getting students engaged. Uh, you can imagine that today children are very easily uh, adopting uh, this new subject matter. Uh, but it's now becoming more and more obvious that without uh, getting the teachers engaged, there is only so much you can do in a classroom environment in schools. So definitely the main challenge for us now, I think probably also for Global Aurea, uh, is sort of solving the, the teacher challenge, uh, getting more teachers engaged uh, as computer science teachers. So uh, following up actually on what uh, my two colleagues already mentioned, um, I would like first to say that hacking for me has nothing to do with technology. Hacking has to do with the way you're thinking. Uh, partly because I'm not very good in technology probably. I don't think technologically, I think strategically. Um, the one thing we have been doing in Shankar in the last uh, four years 
um, has to do with something that uh, I think is very characteristic of higher education systems in general. Higher education system in general are meant to be traditional and they are meant to work according to departments, subject matters. Uh, they are very 19th century oriented. And one of the difficulties, whether it's in design school or elsewhere, um, is to train teachers, train faculty members to think outside their own profession. And therefore, for me, the, the biggest challenge, it is a challenge yet, um, is to work with the teachers. I, uh, as you say, I don't think that I, as a, I, as a president of a college, uh, my concern is with the students. My concern is with my faculty. And I have to take my faculty out of their departments and meet each other. I've been many years in universities. As you know, this is really tremendously difficult. Um, usually, I'm a philosopher by training. There are uh, philosophy departments that I would come as a visitor, and that would be the only occasion people meet because they come to dinner with me. And that's it. They go back to their rooms. They never talk to each other. <laughs> so we started a work that forces the faculty to meet. That sounds simple, but it isn't. And there's no technology involved at all, but there is an idea. And the idea is very simple. Uh, once a year, we do in Shankar something that now you can call a tradition, right? After five years, it's a tradition. Uh, and it's called um, Gem Week. Gem Week is a week that all our third year students and we have design, art, and engineering, all of them together participate in workshops. And the workshops are run together by at least two lecturers, one from design and art, and one from engineering. Now, in order for them to create uh, or to present an offer for a workshop, because we choose the workshops from offers made by the faculty, the faculty had to meet. So we started to create evenings where the faculty meet. We provided the wine, that's very low technology, wine and cheese. <laughs> However, we gave them a reason to start talking to each other. And the result is that now for several years we have faculty working together in order to create joint courses and joint uh, workshops in, uh, in Gem Week. When we choose the faculty, that works on Gem Week. Last year, every, every year Gem Week has a theme. Uh, last uh, year it was movement. It was called Merkacha Zaza. Somehow in Hebrew it was, sounds better. <laughs> we, we took all the faculty participating in Merkacha to dance, which was a huge thing. I mean, you should see the resentment of faculty to things like this. Okay, we are going to dance. We do Hadnarin, great. Then yeah, you yeah. say to someone, would you, Stand up and dance? No. So it takes time, but people started dancing and thinking and working and collaborating and then creating a workshop and then coming together to summarize it. And this, now we're already working on the next year and we are then looking at what we have created and picking the best courses to make them interdisciplinary courses the year after. Now, talking about disruptive Action, this is a very disruptive action from the point of view the way the academy works. So uh, it is actually against the sort of the tendency to specialize. A lot of people will tell you, well, it's too early. It's always too early or too late for the students to meet somehow. <laughs> they're not mature enough or they're too mature. They are sometimes uh, they, there are many, many excuses why not to do something like this. but. Uh, for me, this is the, one of the best things that we've been doing. And it involves one essential thing. It forces people to go out of their comfort zone and do something they've never done before. And that, for me, is hacking education. You can do it with, the with everything. You don't need any uh, additional technology for that. You just need to give people the motivation to do it, and once they do it, they start actually enjoying it. And when they enjoy it, you win them over. And all the rest 
is his group. Thank you. Oh, huh. thank you. This is, this is incredible. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Edith Harrell, and I'm the CEO of Global Aurea. And thank you, Maya, for this great introduction and all your comments. It's hard to be the fourth. So I was changing what I'm about to say as we <laughs> went through this. So here is where I am at this moment. Um, what, what is, where is my passion this year? Uh, and, and what's the biggest challenge that we're trying to, to mitigate? I think that we have to really drive that with a question of what does tomorrow need? And if we all think about what does tomorrow need, it helps us then to redefine literacy. And all of that then helps us decide what are we hacking. So when I think about what, what is tomorrow calling for, what type of education do you want to give young children uh, that are just learning how to read and write and speak versus graduate schools of design or engineering or in the K-12 system that Jonathan and, and, and I are serving? I need to really think to, the challenge is to get everybody in the system to stop and say, we're doing something today because we need it for tomorrow, right? And that is really hard for people to think like this, near term, longer term, and really, really long term. From my perspective, tomorrow is calling for uh, a fluent, computationally literate citizens that can participate in democracy, that can express themselves, that can connect, and they can interact and create and work in teams. And I think we need a generation of uh, citizens who really can fall in love with learning, first and foremost. The most important thing today is to really be passionate and obsessed with learning. And so you're willing to learn new ways all the time because the world is changing so fast. And, and the way we work and interact both in the same physical space or globally is really transforming. So if you really think about that, uh, you can understand why I created this company, Global Aurea, and build a team that says we really have to be obsessed with understanding what tomorrow needs and redefine literacy. And so it's no longer just reading, writing, and arithmetic. It's no longer just reading and writing text, which still a lot of the world is finding, and 55 million kids in the United States in 132,000 schools still are not able to learn how to read and write very well, and now they really have to learn to read and write STEM and computer science and coding, like that is really their new literacy. And so we have to really pack all of this at the same time. And so I'm very passionate about that and I'm trying to figure out ways in which they can do. Uh, there are millions of jobs and fields. There are a lot of positions in government, in political leadership, in business and in education that are unfilled because people need this new literacy and new fluency. And superintendents and principals are in a panic because they cannot find teachers. There are 55 million students and 4 million teachers in the United States. That's a lot compared to Israel, but it's nothing compared to a billion people already on Google or Facebook. So before we know it, we will have 2 billion people who will one day teach and one day learn on the network. And all the roles are switching and the literacy is switching and we need to prepare today the preschool, the elementary school, the middle school, and the high school to really function in that world. And higher education is changing, as we heard from these two leaders. And so we need to work now on really changing because they're going to be in a world where billions of people will one day teach and one day, one day learn, whether they are in fifth grade or in 11th grade or as teachers or as graduate students. And if you start thinking about that, you have to really transform and hack education in big ways. And I'll talk more about that later. Thank you so much. It's exciting for me to hear you use hacking so naturally. So I'm from MIT, hacking, I know, the, the I hacking know. land. I remember. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the, you talked about challenges regarding the new skills we need, and I agree most of our systems are, uh, look like in the 19th century, century. We are in the 21st century. Most of the works that the next generation will do hasn't been created yet because the problem hasn't been created yet. So we, we are preparing our kids, our next generations, to a world we don't know how it will look and we have to give them all this, um, all those new skills that we're not giving them. One of those skills, uh, and uh, again, Adit, this is for you, but all of you uh, feel free. 
So there's a very, very popular TED talk by Ken Robinson that has the title, man, maybe some of you watch it, How Schools Kill Creativity. It has millions of views. And creativity is, is the buzzword now. Every employer looks for creative candidates, individual TED to pride themselves as being creative. It's like almost the new Jewish mom's dream, a creative child. So as someone who's, who's a head of institution that's supposed to teach, encourage, promote creativity, how does it go hand by hand with higher institution, higher education, very structured institution? Well, I think, um, first of all, we are a an arts and design school, so it's, it's, it's a bit different from elsewhere. In our school or in such schools, it's very clear, very basic, very obvious that th this is what we do. We, we discuss creativity uh, every day, every moment. And actually, I should s mention that creativity is one buzzword, but the, the, the maybe the more frequent word is innovation, of course. And everyone's talking about innovation and startups and high-tech uh, industry, etc. But uh, innovation is in the arts ever since. We're there. We're doing that uh, probably from the cave uh, cave painting. Um, so can we can we teach creativity? Um, it's a good question. I'd, uh, for us, we we have talented students, and theoretically, ideally, we have the very talented students, and they are creative already. So it's not about uh, uh, really, um, how would I say, educating or creating the, be, uh, the creativity. It's about developing, uh, enhancing, improving. And I think this, this can be done. It's through assignments, through uh, uh, making them think differently, through this idea I've been uh, describing before, that nothing uh, is, uh, has to be taken for granted or for uh, um, uh, doubt is, is crucial always. Uncertainty is crucial, and you have to recheck and re, uh, re, uh, revi revisit your uh, way of thinking and your solutions uh, again and again. And it's a very uh, uh, common, um, uh, how would I say, it's, it's a very common uh, process in, in design, in working in design, that you create something, you're very happy with it, uh, you had a lot of uh, uh, sketches, you chose one, you go to the client or to whoever, whoever you work with or your lectures, you show it, then this is no good, you go back to the drawing board, you start all over again. And at that moment, it looks hor horrible, it's horrific. I mean, how can I start it again? I've been working on this for months and it's the perfect solution. And then you, you have to work again, you, you go and do the whole thing again and again, and always looking retrospectively, uh, at your first solution, or if your first proposal, you know it wasn't good enough, and it, it did improve uh, during this process of iteration and sketching and prototyping, etc. So this is how we kind of improve uh, creativity. I think this is a process that can be duplicated or replicated to other disciplines other than design, and this is probably ha why uh, design thinking is becoming more and more popular in other fields such as business and, and other uh, sub-disciplines. So, um, yeah, that's, that's for now. We actually formalized exactly that iterative design process in the way we teach computer science, engineering, and design thinking in K-12. And all of our courses, just to, to really amplify everything you're saying, because all of our courses for, for K-12 are designed whether you are taking, you're trying to figure out how to integrate building an app or a simulation in your math class, in your science class, or in your literature class, social studies class, is really about asking a question, trying to come up with research, defining what you want to design, create a prototype, try to program it, change it, because you have to learn a lot of programming. You Sometimes the design doesn't fit with what you wanted or the content, or you do user testing and it doesn't work. And we actually see a big success in both teaching teachers this iterative design as well as teaching students iterative design. And to see very much how, like a new literacy, it's a new way of writing, it really is, they, they really start thinking in this way, whether they're learning JavaScript or Unity or ActionScript, or whether they're learning how to implement JavaScript into mathematics, science, and uh, social studies. And so I think what is really dangerous and also the challenge in teaching this in creative way is to move away from instruction to construction in a way that is replicable, still structured, but also open. 
at the same time. And for us, that's, a, that's the biggest challenge because I think sometimes in graduate schools you find yourself uh, talking about it and then calling people for projects, but with younger people, you sometimes have to start with a project that then their ears are open for the instruction. So again, uh, do less instructionism, more constructionism in the iterative design process. I actually think that's the way to learn anything these days to prepare them for tomorrow. Well, I'll say just one short thing about creativity, and then I want to say something about Ken Robinson talk, <laughs> which I don't like. <laughs> Very much don't like. So, you know, but we talk. No, well, it's a great title yeah. and a bad talk, he, but a very good popular. Speaker. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but uh, so, I, so I think it's important to say why I hate okay. it. Um, you know, I, I escalated. Um, uh, but <laughs> but let me say something about about. Uh, I think we are very fortunate because we teach creative students under the title of where creativity is welcome. When people come because they want to be creative, uh, and they want to work and think about what they are about to be doing. And even if it's difficult to challenge them and to, as I said, to take them out of their silos and ask them to do something else, they are ready to uh, be part of it. And at the end of the day, the kind of uh, interactions that we create are, um, I think, are fantastic. And we get, we see the results, and they're interesting and challenging and creative. And I can speak a lot about creativity in Shankar, but I must say something about Ken Robinson. System, education system, the system at large has so many other functions than creativity. That this is a misguided view of education and it puts the burden of routine on the education, what now people here in America call, and I hate it, the education industry, and makes teachers and people who work in the field of education feel very uncomfortable about what they're doing. It's very easy to create a talk with all these beautiful graphics on how you can make education different. In reality, education is a social structure. It keeps society working. Uh, can you imagine, uh, those of you who have children, what would happen to your life if your children would go to school one day yes and one day no, and they would start once at 10 and once at 11? and then they will uh, work with different age groups, and some of them will graduate before the others. There will be social chaos. I hate the fact that people put, you know, they make education seem old, traditional, impossible, unfitting to the 21st century, but they have no alternative to offer. What they offer is a kind of an illusion, and since this illusion, I'm absolutely convinced, cannot be fulfilled in the school system, there could be moments of creativity in the school system, but the main purpose of the school system, all the world, since the 19th century, and it will be so as far as I can see, is to take children from home and allow parents to work, especially mothers. If you want to try and restructure the system, this is rich people's game. This is not why education systems are there. This has nothing to do with social mobility, with social equality, with social opportunity. It's fun to teach very creative children creativity. The question is, what do you do with all the rest? So I think that when you talk about creative education system, let's not be enchanted by all these you know, beautiful TED Talks. Let's ask ourselves, what can a school two blocks from here in Washington, where half of the children come from poor families and have no support at home and can hardly uh, keep concentrated because they are poor and hungry and distracted. It's not a destructive, uh, productive uh, uh, attitude we think about. It's a destructive, lethal attitude. How can we cope with them? So I, I usually- I, I see you're just very annoyed, okay. Just because I like you, I can't but I want to build, I, I I build on I that. that. No, it was just no, a no, teaser. I came to this uh, panel on creativity. I no, usually no, no. hate it because I think that when people come and then they come home and they say, the system is terrible. And that makes the system even weaker and less able to change. And therefore, I think we should be a little bit.
You're absolutely right. By the way, uh, we have here representative of the Tzofim, of the Scouts. If you ask me why Israelis are creative, it has nothing to do with the school system. It's all about after school, uh, the youth movement, the army, the lots of things that make Israelis creative. Uh, very few of them are related to the school system. But even if you look at the United States or in other places, we should tailor our expectation to large systems that are serving a very mixed audience. So, so, Yuli, so it's different to do something to in Shankar yes, and in downtown you know, Washington. Yuli, you're right. Thanks. Okay. No, no, no. I, I'm all into. I'm all, all, to, all into public education. I couldn't be more supportive. And I want to take wherever you took us to the next level and, and tell you that in Edith's um, front page of her website, it says the company logo is Computer Science for All, all in capital letters. And I want to take ask this forum: What can we? How can we use technology, innovation, the new ways of thinking? to achieve social justice goal and to promote public education, public accessible education for all and not just for rich creative kids. Yeah, and I think I really agree with what Yuli is saying about the TED Talks in general and, and Ken, Ken Robinson in particular. <laughs> and no, 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 but that's okay. You got us to be provocative. So it's a very clever thing that you did. But I think the one thing that I think we have to be careful is uh, in the United States, in a system that I know better and, 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 and uh, working within, you can still cultivate amazing amount of creativity in underserved communities, which is only the communities I serve. Only underserved public schools, first generation high school graduates, sometimes elementary school graduates, kids that their parents speak Spanish or other languages at home, and they will be first generation community college goers or college goers. And there are ways, which is, I'm going to bridge to another thing, but if you're really coming from a perspective, if creativity is what tomorrow needs, and design thinking is what tomorrow needs, you need to still figure out as a designer, as an entrepreneur, how to facilitate, as you say, as you point out, the structure of the system. And I'm very proud of being that person so I've worked with a lot of visionary hackers at MIT who were really thinking about a future that I knew is not going to be implemented in that school system that Yuli is talking about. And my passion was to make it work in the system because I wanted to make sure that everybody, no matter their socioeconomic background, boys and girls, can really, really get a chance, which they can only get in school because they don't have high bandwidth, it's too expensive, they don't have the iPads and the smartphones, their parents work three jobs, and they don't do Khan Academy in their bedroom. That's a myth. Millions of kids, 50 million out of the 55 million in America's schools can only get it in school, and if we believe that creativity is important, we have to figure out how to train their teachers, how to work with their principals, how to align it with standards, and even how to create rubrics and assessments and make it fit in an equal way in the system, that the system feels comfortable and incorporated and sort of you hack from within and you move from the edge to inside to the edge again, right? So I'm very respectful of the system and I'm still believing that you can do it and you have to. It's almost like that's the social justice aspect. You have to, you have to make sure, and that's the mission of my company, that boys and girls who are very engaged in this underserved community have at least an hour, an hour and a half, or two hours a day when they can get this cutting edge education like you give in Shankar, you have to give in Betzel El, or I got at MIT Media Lab, very, very young. And I think that's the social justice because otherwise it's in some top percentile, top percentile private schools or even some Jewish day schools, and that's not the way it should be, right? And there are ways. So we figured it out. Uh, unfortunately, technology really allows us through blended learning democratize creativity, iterative design, design thinking, computational innovation in ways that we use teachers and train them to do what they're really great at, building the class community, understanding priorities, building teams, guiding students, caring for them, and the technical education and a lot of the things that are intimidating for today's teachers for now can come from us. 
We can provide help centers and coding coaches and a lot of experts. And actually, it's one of the skills that we need to teach teachers to do and students to do to find expertise outside of their physical classroom. It's good to be in a classroom that they have to be there because they cannot do it any other way. So it's a social responsibility for us to provide it and then teach them how to access the expertise in a structured, guided way, aligned with standards and grade levels and everything. And it can be done. And that's, that's kind of like, I'm very passionate about that because if we don't do it, we're gonna miss millions of kids who will have no jobs, will not participate in democracy, will not know who's running for president. It's going to be very, very, very bad. I, you want? Comment very yes, quickly sure. just to, uh, to what Edith is saying and Yuli. Um, that w everything you described right now in the process you're doing is in fact a, de a design process because it's about uh, uh, solving a problem or approaching a problem within a context and understanding the restrictions, the constraints, exactly. understanding that you have to work within the system but you can be creative, you can be inno innovative, you can create, you can revolutionize within the system. It's not only about deconstruction and breaking all the rules, it's it is breaking the rules, but within the system. I think it unites us in a nice way, actually, in this yeah. panel, that we all figured out a way of innovating within a system and getting the system to move forward towards innovation. Yeah. And that's art, not science. That's design. Yeah. It's, design. it's design, not science. But that's, that's the difference between so art we, and So we plan for many more questions, but I feel like we should give yeah. our audience, woo, wait. So I think it's relevant to all of you because each of us is a learner themselves. Many of us are educators or have kids or have employees. So, um, please, yes. Uh, wait, we have the thing. Thing. Yes. Not my best skill. It's your mic. It's the mic, yeah. Yeah, just talk to it. Okay. So as of right now, the way most American schools work is teachers will teach in class and then they give us homework and that's how we relearn or actually engrave into our brains what we're supposed to know. So with your initiative, uh, the, uh, bringing technology and teaching K through 12 kids the new technology and how to use it, how are they supposed to learn even more if they can't bring it home with them if they can't experiment on their own in their own free time? That's a great question and it's a complicated one. So in some school systems that are so poor, um, you really have to make sure that a superintendent or principal make the decision to provide it for everybody for at least an hour or two a day in an equal way. And until they actually have public spaces, community centers and libraries where the students can all equally go home, and of course, because our global OER service is on the cloud, so it, it's accessible from anywhere, they actually, they actually don't give students homework that relates to this project, so it's not gonna be a situation, of course, some students will always go to a, a father's <laughs> office or the library, but it's not assigned in a way, and they give project time and team time to do it in the school. So then the next step is that they see their kids are so engaged, and with computers that like Chromebooks that now cost $170, they can actually support that because textbooks cost $100, $120 too. So instead of buying textbooks, they buy the Chromebooks and the kids can continue with their projects with the digital textbooks, the digital workbooks, and the digital design projects, both at home and in school. And that's a very important step that we see in many communities. Jonathan, you wanted yeah, to? Just a small story, because I had the same question. I was speaking at South by Southwest Education, and I had exactly the same question about the equity in computer science education, because we rely on in infrastructures that a lot of students don't have at home. Uh, so we just, it's, it's a story from the comp Cold Monkey competition in Israel last year. The school, uh, the competition again was what about uh, which schools, students of which school perform best on average. So you need all the students to go through the game and to progress. And the school that was performing best was actually uh, probably from the poorest village in Israel. It's, a, it's an Arabic village on the border of Israel and Lebanon. Uh, they performed so well that actually uh, suspicious arose about whether they're cheating. <laughs> uh, so uh, the Ministry of Education sent an inspector and they found out 
that the entire village uh, became so involved with that that all the teachers, students, and parents would come up after school hours in the evening to the school lab. So what I learned from this is when you have the engagement uh, piece solved very, uh, in a very strong way, uh, then people tend to overcome the technical challenges. Yes, next question. Hi, so Dr. Harrell, you, you started a discussion with the fact we need to build a generation that is passionate about learning, right? And to get passion, you need to be inspired. So I'm wondering, what do you do in order to create that inspiration or to have the teachers inspire the next generation to be passionate about studying? That's a great question. Um, I talked about it previously in the previous panel I participated. I think asking questions is probably the most important thing uh, to, to create curiosity, interest, engagement, and, and passion. Um, and, and I told the story about how my father came back every day from school, from his school. He was a principal since I was three and said, do you have a a hard question for me today, every day. And then he will clarify, but a really big question. <laughs> and yeah, he really drove me to be obsessed about questions and looking around the world, looking around me and asking questions. And to understand at the end that questions can really drive exploration, questions really drive knowledge development. And most kids that I work with in these underserved communities don't know how to ask questions. It's not in their culture. They're shy, they're intimidated, they don't have that question asking confidence that I call mindset. And so just starting there and really figuring out, because questions really drive design and they drive everything, right, innovation. So if you just really invest in creating a culture when questions are respected and asking big questions is a really big piece of the process, then you, you really start with, 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 minds, with minds that are asking questions and driven to do research, exploration, and come up with an idea. And even if it's not a very good idea or an idea that somebody did before, it still drives them to something that they personally care about. And it doesn't mean that you teach fractions or, or you teach um, uh, the life cycle of the cell in biology in 10th grade, whatever it is, you can still run it through questions in that topic that covers things that you need to cover in your standards, in your textbooks, but it's, it's that that really drives the research, the prototype making, the initial design, and then the computer science learning that I really believe in. I just want to add that uh, when you really allow teachers to um, think and ask questions, uh, you should be expecting that different things will happen and to give them the freedom uh, or the autonomy to um, run the system in a way that is not naturally uh, anticipated by those who are uh, you know, supervising over them. I think there's much too, uh, much too much supervision in schools today. Um, it's very hard to create the creative cultures where people ask questions and um, make experiments when uh, you are expected at the end to reach uh, one conclusion or one result that is therefore evaluated. Evaluation kills creativity. If something kills creativity in the 21st century, it's transparency and over um, accountability, which became a disease. Um, I told you about uh, this experiment we did in Shankar um, of Jemwick, and the, the students are getting two points for participation in it, and the teachers became very much intimidated. They said, how would we evaluate it? I said, don't evaluate it. They just get two points because they participate in it. They said, no, 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 but no, it should be serious, so how do we, we evaluate? I said, don't. They said, well, what if we fail? I said, well, you know, every, every startup fails sometimes. I mean, fail, I don't care. It's not about success. Just do it, enjoy it. How about let's have a week where we all enjoy what we're doing and I don't care what is the result. And they really, in the, in the first two years, they tasted me. They, they tested me. They did all sort of crazy things. And I said, fine, I like it. I don't mind. Just go out of your you know, pattern of expectation 
and do something different. But if you are a school teacher, I can tell you, school teachers are the most frightened population in the country. Here, they are everywhere. And when you tell them, take the risk, ask questions, do something unusual, and then their supervisor says, did you finish all the blooms, what is called the bloom categories? Did Taxidermy. you do that? They don't want to do anything because they're so frightened. We have killed the teaching profession. And I sit in, the, in a university where I'm the most radical person, I think, of all my staff in my th thinking about teaching. But in the school system, it's very difficult. So it's very nice to tell teachers, you know, be experimental. You know, do things that are unusual. But how do they then, uh, you know, get their evaluations? Who responds to them? Who protects them when they make a mistake? No one. You know what I found out in my research? That the only ones that are doing it are the ones that said, <coughs> we have so much confidence and trust from the system. They don't care what we're doing, so we're just doing it and no one knows. <laughs> and and, and that's actually, I asked, do people know what you're doing? They say, no, I'm just doing it. I took yeah. the initial and do it, but there are not many because the rest are intimidated right. and have to fill some fun. But there is another solution. So as, a, a, as we use technology to facilitate the overcoming the fear is so really what we're talking about. We decided, we did quest questionnaires and we realized, yes, they're, they're scared to innovate because of all the things they need to cover. So we decided to create a technology in the back end that gives them what they need to cover so they don't have to worry about it. So we take every course they teach with all the computer science and engineering skills and in the back end, they tell us right away, we're gonna do it twice a week or three times a week. We're gonna do it in math and science, this great, this great. We said, boom, here is your standards. This is what you're covering. When you're doing this, and they're like, oh, this is so amazing. They don't have to worry about anything now because they have a record that technology can generate. So with technology, we can also help teachers overcome their fear. And we were able to align it, whether it's the TEKS in Texas and the Common Core in New York or the A2G in California or the WestEd in West Virginia, or whatever it is, we were able, to, with technology, to pour it all in, to give it an all out, they print it, they have it, and now they can do whatever they want. So it's amazing. So use technology cleverly. Yes, please. My name is Adam Kaplan. I'm the parent of two, uh, two elementary school girls, 10 and 7 years old, in uh, Michigan. And uh, my daughters are privileged to go to a school called Hillel Day School. About 10 years ago, the uh, visionary uh, head of school decided to take everyone on a journey to transforming the institution into an institution like the ones that you described. So I've been privileged to be a part of that journey for six years. And what I can tell you is uh, it, it's a dramatic change and nothing like we ever experienced growing up in any schools we were ever in. Um, so anyone who's sitting here and thinks that all this is, is just pie in the sky stuff, um, it's not, but it's definitely a, a really, really long process. And parents have to be educated, I think, as much as the students do about that. Um, and it's a continual, continually uh, growing and educational process. So um, my question to the panel is, what kinds of observations do you have that either support or uh, go against what I just described? Do you have parents' involvement in higher education or they leave you alone? <laughs> well, they phone you and say, my child got 65. I think I, that was a major work. I think he should be at least 80. Wow. No. <laughs> I, I, here, is, here is, so I just, I just flew in from Texas last night, late night, and I was at Beeville. Beeville is close to the south, south Texas farmland, very poor, close to the border of Mexico. I'm very fortunate because the school board there, um, and the superintendent decided to do a town-wide, school-wide, in all six campuses, pre-K to 12, global area curriculum every day in every class with between 254 teachers of all ages. And, and, and it was not, not easy, but um, we've been doing this in other places throughout the United States, but this is just happening in the last month. And um, it's doable. And I think in many ways, Working district-wide, when it's mandatory for all teachers to be trained, 
and it is mandatory for all classes to run in a certain way. And there are, there are teachers there, and I'm sorry to say this, didn't know how to do cut and paste or the browsers have tabs or, you know, like really, 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 really not literate when it comes to very basic computer skills, right? Um, they're, they're all of a sudden moving forward, and then you have to use what we call now blended learning, which is some instruction will be face-to-face -face with the teachers, some instruction will be face-to-face -face with the principal, superintendent, and the school board, and the students at all levels, parents too. And most of it, though, in order to scale, will have to come with the technology. And I think the technology needs to be smart with dashboards and tracking the teacher level, the principal level, the student level, and everything to know who needs more support that is totally virtual, who needs more support that is face-to-face, -face, and to really try to figure out all these uh, flavors, which, again, is happening in a lot of other industries. And we can just do that in education, too. I can add one sentence about regarding your remark about parents. As a parent of, parent of three girls, I, I find sometimes parents as an obstacle to innovation. Sometimes parents will approach school and say, my kid doesn't have enough homework. Right. Maybe they're not progressing enough. No, it's real story. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think an organization that has an atmosphere of being innovative, as we did said, ver is very helpful. Yes. Well, I think parent participation may play out very differently in a, in, a, in a day school in Michigan and in a place there. And there, I think maybe you need to offer, I, I don't know, what is there some kind of parent su Parent First support of all, we or invitation. Need to offer it in multi language Spanish. Yeah, that, English, yeah, of course. And we need to do it. Not all of them have time because of the kind mm, of. No, it has, to be, it has to be in the morning, it has to be in the evening. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm asking yeah. kind of what, what you do have, yeah, if it, anything. It needs to be innovative in all these ways that you mentioned. Yeah. And, uh, and it is probably what's going to happen best is that the students will go to one or two courses, they will form groups and clubs to teach the parents. Um, yes. Micah, there are um, benefits to being someone I know. We have great technology, and we run a biotech. <laughs> we run a biotech, and, and we love creativity and innovation. These are some of our big words. But how does philosophy and, and some of the things that maybe we take a little bit for granted, how does that get incorporated into this new technology? How do we get people to realize that liberty and pursuit of happiness and some basic things and respect are, are part of the curriculum, if you will? Can technology really take over that? Can, can you say the question again? How do we yeah, so how does philosophy, the short, answer, short question, how does philosophy get incorporated into the STEAM or STEM? We have innovation, we have science, technology, but how do we actually make citizens and people that actually understand that you don't get to be a democracy without understanding where it all is, is founded? I think if I'll use the Hebrew terms, you're, using a, you're talking about hora'a, uh, olemida, and chinuch. Ani lo mevin. I know. <laughs> but in, in Hebrew, there are two different words. One uh, concerning the, the values about how being a good citizen, being a human uh, behaving in society, and one is talking more about skills and knowledge. Yeah, and the soft skills so and the hard skills. So now I'll let someone else answer. Okay. I answer that. Um, so the way I feel regarding the role of ad tech for that educational technologies uh, is like you did mention briefly in our previous uh, answer is that the role of technology is mainly for that is mainly to free uh, the teacher's time and attention to handle those stuff on their own because they are really the only one that can do it and if you move away uh, 50% of the time that they're spending on creating lesson plans or checking grades or evaluating, and you do that <laughs> using educational technologies, um, then the teacher has much more time to do those kind of stuff. But also, in, when, we, when we learn on a network, which is actually a skill, global is like the training wheels, because that's, you, you will continue to learn a lot on networks all your life these days, and definitely 10, 20, 30 years from now. Um, we actually devote a unit in our curriculum in every course on how to participate, what's ethical, we talk about transparency, credit, how do you comment on each other's logs and journals and designs, how do you give feedback, how do you work in teams, 
These are all very important values that you have to include in everything you teach these days because that's how we work. That's, you know, I, I have teams in California, Washington, New York, Austin, and Houston, and I work with all of them in ways that are really calling for these uh, values. And it is, um, it is it's, it's, it's integral to everything also for the students to do in everything that they learn, which actually in design and art school is kind of like it goes without saying. They do art critiques, they look at each other designs, they know how to comment, and they, they learn it. And I think to know how to do this also in a math class, in a science class, and in the career technical education class is very, very important. I, I also want to add something that I think um, in that respect, technology is just is really just a tool. I mean, it can simplify, it can enhance, it can um, um, make things uh, easier for the student and for the uh, uh, teacher. Um, but it's not it's not about the content. I mean, you can use uh, you should use technology and well-designed platforms in order to teach everything. It can go for history, philosophy, or the uh, sciences. And uh, I think the, the wise uh, use of technology today enables us so much uh, that wasn't possible in the past uh, that we, we just have to do it, I mean, in all disciplines. Thank you. But beware of the fact that the people that use technology most often are not necessarily the good guys, right? We, uh, we just came from this debate about uh, creative leadership in Brighton, and somebody gave a list of uh, what creativity is all about, and then I said, Okay, I know a guy who actually already did deal this. It's the guy who planned the bomb in New York now. He used uh, recycled materials, he took it from the web, he shared it with others, everything. So it's, it's, it's normatively neutral. Uh, how do you teach ethics? That's a different question. Now, technology is something that could be used, as Avi rightly said, for better and for worse, and that's, that's, let's not delude ourselves to think it's going to be just for the better. It's a double-edged sword, for sure. Um, first of all, to thank you for this amazing panel. Um, I'm um, principal of a Jewish day school in the Chicago area. It's a private school. It's not very affluent, but it's, I think, a place where innovation and the use of technology can really assist us because we're not bound by district or by, and like we could tell a teacher, not whispering, do it, just Change the curriculum, change the way you deliver it. You know, reach the children in different ways. And also I want to add to it, of all the fields of knowledge that you uh, mentioned, especially uh, UAD, um, we use technology even for the study of Torah. Number one, you know, studying in Torah and Talmud is like the first area of in inquiry, asking questions. But beyond that, using we are a Google school, so we use all the tools that Google provides us, which are free to our school, um, to, to increase the in inquiry, the questioning, the desire, the curiosity, and the collaboration of commenting on each other, um, even in our Torah studies. Uh, so, and I'm listening to Yuli and to Edith, and I'm so torn. Yeah, you're right. Schools are old and I'm, I walk into my classrooms and I see, I still see rows and I still see teachers like even shy away sometimes from the smart board and use the whiteboard because it's just easier than turning it on. Um, and I ask myself, how do I change that? How do I change that? How do I come in the class and see groups sitting on the floor creating and innovating? How do I change that? And I really think that uh, what was said here before is like, one of our most important work here is to work with our teachers. Our teachers were educated in the old ways. Even some of the young teachers are just the beginning of people who received that type of vision and that type of uh, philosophy. So the number one is to allow the teachers to get rid of their fears, to unleash in the teachers themselves the idea of creativity is a good thing. So. I, I love what you're saying, and I think our research, you did a lot of research on different modalities of professional development, and, and Yuli gave a vivid example, like how she does it with her faculty, and I think it's definitely the essence. So 
we really, we really now implement three days of training. We don't even start using our software anywhere without three days of training face to face with the teachers. Now we also have a virtual equivalent of that. The first two days, they actually take the, the and they just take the course like a student. They said, forget about your students, you're not a teacher. You are now learning hands-on, free to explore, to be scared, to ask questions, to design, to work in teams, and to do this. And the more you do that in a regular basis with your faculty, uh, and that's really where everything starts, because many of them did not experience learning something new for so long, and they did not experience learning and being challenged with diverse minds and diverse type of teachers. And, and all of a sudden, like they forgot what is learning. So you have to remind them to connect to their core in their hearts and their stomachs and their minds and their hands on. That's learning. Then after they learn and they really are figuring this out as learners, we take them through day three, which is, okay, enter our system. Now you're gonna learn how to teach this course. And it's very hard because for 48 hours, they really want to already think about how they teach us and what, how their accounts will be created and what will they do with Jimmy who has, uh, who's, who has some disabilities or whatever. We say, no, 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 you are now learners and only in the third day we will allow you to ask such questions and it's a very hard thing. But once you put them in the modality and then we bring them back in two months and we bring them back in two months and we do virtual equivalences of this and it's, it's about reminding people how fun it is to learn and what it is that they need to now cultivate in their students. And also we use your teachers to teach each other. Yeah. If, we, if we believe in peer collaboration and, 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 and students teaching each other, we should also use our teachers to teach the little that they know to the next person. It's contagious. And, and you are their leader, you are their protector. And if you allow them this freedom, they'll take it. And I think that this is very often something headmasters don't understand, that they are the enablers. You don't have to be teaching them, you just have to unleash their powers and then protect them if they go wrong, if they don't use their time in the perfect way. Just give them the time to do that. And somebody said here, it's a process. It will take time, but if you constantly protect them, they will learn to trust you. And it's all about trust. When they trust you, you know, Everybody speaks about why the Finnish education system is so good. And um, uh, the answer is very complex, but one of the, of the reasons is that they have a lot of trust in their teachers. And there's no national curriculum, no standards, no common core, nothing. They just train teachers and let them teach. Now, I don't think Israel certainly is not uh, ready for that, certainly not the United States. but. If in your school system, in my school system, the teachers feel I trust them, and when they run into problem because they've done something too crazy or too risky, I'll protect them, then they'll do it. So I think it's about the leadership of, of people who are running educational institution. That's more, as I said earlier, that's the thing that is more important than technology, than anything else. It's about this interrelationship between you and your teachers that allows them to be really outstanding. I want to thank you all. You inspired us.